I'm pleased to announce that for our purposes, the quorum is present. <laughs> um, the subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We welcome everyone here today to a hearing on intellectual property protections for AI assisted inventions and creative works. Most importantly, I will now recognize myself to recap where we are on AI and intellectual property. I believe this, the subcommittee on a very broad basis has been at the forefront of Congress's examination of intellectual property and artificial intelligence. Today's hearing titled again, Artificial, Intellig artificial Intelligence and, in and Intellectual Property Part Three shows the fact that we have in fact looked at this from three different ways, but perhaps 30 or 40 different ways when you look at the nuances that have been covered. To cover just a few in our inquiry, recognizing that our role in AI is different than other committees. Many think that this is about protecting against public disclosure. And although the Constitution is within our district, this or within our jurisdiction, this committee and this subcommittee will particularly and has focused on Article I, Clause 8 of the Constitution, a requirement to promote, a requirement to reward so that we in fact continue to have useful arts and inventions created. I make that point because in fact one of the greatest threats that we have found in earlier hearings is that if in fact we grant no protection for patents, trademarks, copyrights that are somehow produced by AI, then in fact, could we find ourselves dismantling a system that has made the United States the most innovative and successful country in the history of mankind? Today, uh, we will continue, uh, without a doubt, to explore AI in a context of IP theft related to China. There are others who steal IP, but nobody who does it as well as China. Very simply, how do we def today, how do we define authorship when AI is part of the creative process? We particularly know that the Copyright Office has made a bold statement that 100% AI generated will not be copyrightable. In our research, we have discovered that, in fact, there is no such thing at this time as 100% AI generated. In order to generate a copyrighted work, there has to be an input of what you want, an input of how you want it. The Copyright Office has not opined on this, but we will today ask you and others to opine on exactly that, where the line should be, how close it should be. I want to particularly draw attention in my opening statement to an example of my, one of my heroes, one of the most iconic piano players, and in fact, the piano man, Billy Joel, who recently produced, and is just beginning to uh, make the public aware, an AI-generated mu music video. His music, his likeness, in fact, it's him at three different ages, but none of the characters underlying it, none of the motions were in fact his, but rather actors who made movements, and then with AI, that was covered with Billy Joel, very young. Billy Joel, not so young. And Billy Joel, still younger than he is today, but not young at all. The fact is, we have creative geniuses amidst us in, in song uh, and other uh, arts who no longer have the ability on their own. They may not have the, the vocal range. They may not, in fact, be fit to tour and yet they can still create. One of that's one of the challenges we'll face today. I will say without a doubt, this committee intends to be forward leaning on providing intellectual property protection for these creations and finding a way to do it will not in fact turning everything over to the machine and thus denigrating or de reducing the effectiveness of what you might call old-fashioned creation. For that reason, 
the, the questions will, in fact, be asking all of you to help us understand how far can we go to continue to recognize that creations thought of by man, assisted by machine, in fact, need to be protected. And with that, it's my pleasure to recognize my ranking member, the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing today. As most of the people in this room already know, well, did we silence? That was Billy Joel. That was Billy Joel, <laughs> yes. That was my wife. <laughs> as most of the people in this room already know, this is part three in a series of hearings on the impact of artificial intelligence on intellectual property and innovation. And I'm proud to join my chairman, Mr. Issa, in this ongoing examination of the state of innovation in America. Artificial intelligence is changing how the world works right before our very eyes. And this subcommittee has considerations not just over the IP implications of the final outputs of AI models, but also how these models are trained. While some of the issues we discuss here today exist only as hypotheticals for future iterations of generative AI technologies, other issues are already real and before us, impacting the way we do business and live our lives today. And I'm looking forward to continuing our conversation in part four, whatever the topic might be. When we sit down behind the wheel of our car, lean over and turn on the radio, we expect the song we hear to be a work created by a human artist. The beat, the melody, the words, the riffs, we take for granted as having sprung from the mind of a fresh and blood, or excuse me, a flesh and blood creator. But what happens when that is no longer the case? The question we will examine today is when a work of art or original inventions should no longer be worthy of intellectual property protection. Generative AI can both produce original content and assist the production of original content that would clearly be eligible for IP, IP protections if created entirely by a human. An algorithm can spit out original lyrics for a songwriter to put to music, and it can analyze large sets of data for a scientist developing a new chemical compound. It is not debatable that these basic operations are already reality, and already we are beginning to see artists and scientists seeking protection of such creations through copyright and patent. AI cannot be listed as an inventor on a patent. It cannot own a copyright. The courts and the Copyright Office have, respectively, already addressed those basic questions. But the question of how much AI involvement renders a product as no longer having been created by a human being remains open. Both the Copyright Office and the Patent, Trade, Patent and Trademark Office have released guidance and are continuing to address the issue of how we should, as a society, treat AI-created AI or AI-assisted works of innovation. I applaud President Biden, Director Vidal, and Director Perlmutter for addressing these questions head on. From the initial guidance, it's clear that the question of how much AI is too much for IP protection is far from a straightforward question. Yes, generative AI, excuse me, yes, generative AI can write an essay, but the nuances between AI assistance and 100% AI creation are substantial. Moreover, innovations made with the assistance of AI are the final product in a long chain of creators. AI is typically developed by one set of people trained on the data of many others, which often includes others' copyrighted property and, is, and then is deployed by a third set who become the model's users. That model then turns around to be used in lucrative ways like finding aberrations in data sets or making a better auto-tune for a song. 
I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses how they believe we should address these nebulous questions about the inseparable nature of human and machine creativity and whether existing copyright and patent laws provide any guidance. While those conversations are ongoing, it's also time for Congress to examine what our involvement should be, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses what legislative tools they believe agencies, inventors, and creators need to keep our intellectual property system strong. We must remember that at its heart, intellectual property protections exist to keep our community strong. Looking at my home district near Atlanta, Georgia, patents drive the creation of new business and emerging community leaders. Copyright protections protect up and coming new artists and allow creators to make a living off of their talents, contributing to the fabric, depth, and color of the towns we call home. And both drive the growth of vibrant cities. In fact, the U.S. Census Bureau last month named the metropolitan Atlanta area the sixth largest and third fastest growing region in the country. Because of this, we should approach the question of IP protection for AI-driven works, both from a legal jurisprudence perspective, but also from a human one, by asking at every step what helps creators we are more likely to end up with a system that keeps working the way it should, no matter what revolutionary new technologies come our way. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. I'd like to begin by thanking Chairman Ice and Ranking Member Johnson for holding this bipartisan hearing to examine the scope of intellectual property protection for artificial intelligence generated and AI-assisted works. Gener generative AI may be in its nascency, but many models are already capable of creating works that, if created by a human, would be eligible for copyright protection. Inventors, similarly, are using AI to aid in their discoveries. While AI that is capable of creating an invention eligible for patent protection under Section 101 of the Patent Act may, debatably, not exist just yet, the involvement of generative AI in innovative processes still raises the question of how much AI involvement takes away the human element of discovery. The question presented at this hearing is narrow at first glance. Simply, how much human needs to be involved uh, for a creation to warrant intellectual property protection? When we discuss generative AI, it is often in terms of broader controversies, including ingestion, practical application, and the replication of human works and styles. But discussions like the ones this subcommittee is embarking on today can launch us in entirely unique, unexplored directions. How much AI is too much to render something a human creation? Whether some uses of generative AI are more acceptable as tools than others? And how we even could tell a final product was created by a machine rather than by a person are all valid questions that ensue from this narrow starting point. While the technology may be new, the philosophical questions presented here today are not. In 1637, René Descartes debuted the first principle of, of his uh, principles of philosophy, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Over 300 years later, in 1950, mathematician Alan Turing established what became known as the Turing test to determine whether or not a computer is capable of thinking like a human being. And the ability of AI to think and create has been examined repeatedly throughout science fiction. Star Trek The Next Generation even examined the essential question of the rights of a highly advanced AI character called Data in its two, season two episode, Measure of a Man. While it did not unfortunately delve into questions of IP protection for data, Data's creative works, it is emblematic of the centuries-long interest in the possibility of artistry, intelligence, and innovation by non-human entities. Many of the philosophical questions presented by AI and science fiction are far enough in the future that they are not concerns before the Judiciary Committee. But the practical questions of whether and how to extend intellectual property protections to AI-assisted works is very much a question for the here and now. 
Both the Copyright Office and the Patent and Trademark Office have begun addressing the question through draft guidance to create basic rules of the road for artists and creators seeking to protect works developed with the use of generative AI. Just over a year ago, the Copyright Office issued the first guidance governing intellectual property claims for works developed with the assistance of AI. The office informed artists that in these cases, copyright protection will only be available for the part of a final product created by a human, and it asked that the creators identify which parts of each work of authorship were developed using AI. President Biden, in last fall's executive order on AI, directed the USPTO to develop guidance as well for governing the use of AI in claimed inventions before the patent office. Just two months ago, the PTO issued initial, quote, inventorship guidance and examples for AI-assisted inventions, close quote. Like the Copyright Office, the question under the PTO guidelines is not whether or not AI was used in the creation or invention, but how much human innovation and involvement there was in the creation of the invention. I applaud the Copyright and Patent Offices for taking much needed first steps to clarify what should and should not receive intellectual property protections as generative AI becomes increasingly and indelibly incorporated in our society and how we create. Patents and copyrights are two very different types of intellectual property, and it is important that we acknowledge this reality as we continue conversations about how AI can and should be used in their development. There is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all approach to innovation, and we would be remiss if we failed to recognize this. But many questions remain unexplored in both the patient and uh, patent and copyright realms. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses about what they think is missing from the guidance and from these conversations overall. For example, the guidance at both agencies leaves open the question of how to maintain candor and honesty in applications for IP protection. And I'm particularly looking forward to hearing from our witnesses regarding how we can enforce the AI rules we create. AI undoubtedly will have enormous impact on our IP systems and it is imperative that we, as the Judiciary Committee, consider how best to ensure that our innovation protections remain strong, even as technologies change. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the ranking member. All other uh, members will have uh, the ability to have their opening statements placed in the record. It is now my, uh, distinguished, my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel of witnesses uh, starting with Ms. Sandra Astars, who is the, a clinical professor at the George Mason University, the Antonin Scalia Law School, where she leads the school's arts and entertainment program. Professor Astars is also a senior fellow for copyright research and policy at the, at, and a senior scholar at the Center for Intellectual Property by Innovation Policy. Prior to joining the Scalia Law School, she was the Chief Executive Officer of the Copyright Alliance, a nonprofit public interest organization that advocates on behalf of artists and creators, and I had the opportunity to see her in that role. Next, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Car Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Garcia. Uh, uh, she is, she, I'm sorry, she is at the Ann Fleming Research Professor at the Georgetown University School of Law. Professor Garcia's work focuses on intellectual property law through the lens of law and economics. She previously taught at the University of Colorado Law School, was a fellow at George Washington University Law School, and spent nearly a decade working in the music industry. Welcome. We next have Mr. Uh, Joshua Landau. Mr. Landau is a senior counsel for innovation, innovation policy at the Computer and Communications Industry Association, where he focuses on patent issues. He previously worked in private practice at Wilmer Hale, where he, presented, uh, he represented clients in patent litigation, counseling, uh, and prosecution in proceedings before the district courts and the PTAB. Lastly, we have Ms. Claire Laporte. Ms. Laporte is the Intellectual Property Fellow at the Gingo Bioworks, uh, a bio, 
a biotechnology company focusing on cell programming. She previously served as the company's head of intellectual property and design um, and IP strategy and oversaw its implementation. Before joining, Ms. Laporte was a trial attorney in a private practice where she focused on patent and trademark secret cases. We welcome all our witnesses and pursuant to the committee's rules, would you please rise to take an oath? Raise your right hand if you would. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. If you haven't seen this a thousand times on C-SPAN, and many of you have testified before, let it be said that every part of collateral material, including your full written uh, copy of your oral statement, will be placed in the record. So in that case, we would ask that you do the best you can to remain within the five minutes so that we can get to the questions that we all have. Because I know today you have answers for our questions. So with that, we go to Professor, it says, okay, it is A-STARS first. Professor A-STARS. Thank you. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I do not represent anyone on these issues, and I'm appearing on my own behalf. My recent scholarship is focused primarily on visual art, but my comments this morning are applicable to copyright more broadly as well. I believe that when determining whether to register claims of copyright for creative works made by humans with the use of generative AI, or GAI for short, we should look to the acts of the human, not at the outputs of the GAI. If a human has met the minimal creativity requirements set out by the Supreme Court in Feist, the question is whether the interaction with the GAI is undermining a claim to human authorship or extending authentic human vision for a work. Applying this approach, at least some creative works authored by humans using the assistance of GAI will be protectable by copyright. Second, Liability for training of GAIs must be resolved, but denying IP protection to otherwise protectable works to humans who use GAIs is counterproductive. It will relegate legitimate human works to the category of synthetic data. Denying copyright to humans who create works with the assistance of GAIs if the work is otherwise sufficiently original to qualify for protection will do nothing to instill respect for IP rights in those who develop and train GAIs. To the contrary, doing so will merely disenfranchise creative workers from being able to claim copyright in expressive works based on the media or tools they choose to work with, relegating their works to the category of synthetic data and foreclosing to these human artists the opportunity to control or be compensated for use of their works. Third, turning otherwise protectable GAI-assisted creative works into synthetic data exploits human creators. Creating a class of unprotectable synthetic works would be a windfall to GAI companies because such works would immediately become available for GAI training without the need for any permissions from the human creator who used the GAI to make the creative work. This exploits creative workers on both the input side by not protecting copyright in the initial materials the GAI is trained on, and on the output side by not protecting copyright in the expressive works created by humans using the GAI in their authorship. My main point, copyright law should continue to function in a technology neutral fashion. The minimalist spark of creativity test for originality from Feist can readily be adapted to fit the GAI authorial workflow. The proper inquiry in the GAI context is whether the human author has used the GAI as an artist uses any tool or material in their art making practice. Has the artist 
deployed GAI or engaged it authentically and in their own voice in a manner that demonstrates the artist is staying true to their creative vision. I describe this more fully in my written testimony. The author should not be asked to dissect creative works element by element in order to, pr to prove control or foreseeability over the precise operation of GAI tools. The Copyright Office currently requires authors to disclose and disclaim more than de minimis use of GAI in creative works. This, pro uh, this approach causes problems for creators. The Copyright Office guidelines do not marry well with the art making practices of visual artists and other creators because they require the creator to exercise control and foreseeability over a device that they have not manufactured, trained, or deployed into the marketplace. Instead, the relevant inquiry should be, as I describe in my testimony, whether the creator is executing their own intellectual conceptions. Are they engaging the GAI authentically and in their own voice? Are they staying true to their own creative vision? I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions this morning. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Thank you, good morning, Chairman Issa, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, Ranking Member Nadler, and the members of the subcommittee uh, for inviting me to testify today about the copyrightability of works that are generated in whole or in part by artificial intelligence. My name is Cristela Garcia, I'm a law professor at Georgetown where I teach and research on issues relating to copyright law. In my written testimony, I make three primary assertions. The first is that works wholly or substantially generated by AI do not merit copyright protection. Second, that works only partially generated by AI may merit copyright protection. And finally, and most relevant for your purposes, that there is no call for legislative action at this time. And I'd like to use my time today to present a couple of examples that illustrate and support these determinations. My first example goes to works wholly or substantially generated by AI. So let's say that I direct ChatGPT with a simple prompt to write congressional testimony. And I don't give it anything else, I don't give it the topic or the points that I'd like to make, any conclusions to reach. Uh, the resulting work then can hardly be said to have been authored by me in the sense that I couldn't possibly predict nor control uh, what the AI is going to write, nor can the resulting writing be said to be the product of my original intellectual conception. And I can also tell you from disappointing personal experience that it's not especially good at it either. Um, now, the work that would result from my giving a simple prompt to write congressional testimony doesn't marry copyright protection for a number of reasons. First and foremost, because AI is not human, it doesn't meet the statutory definition of an author. You may recall hearing about that case a few years back of the macaques monkeys who were denied a copyright in their selfies. We have the same situation here. No human, no copyright. And I'll say we should recall further that the photographer in that case, himself a human, was also denied a copyright in the monkeys photos. This is because despite befriending the monkeys and giving them a camera, the court found that the, uh, the photographer had not sufficiently contributed to the ultimate images in that he could neither predict nor importantly control and which did not then reflect his own original intellectual conceptions. And even if we could overcome this doctrinal improbability, why would we? The AI in my example wasn't incentivized by copyright protection to write the testimony. It was just responding to my direction as it has been programmed to do. And if we did nonetheless grant a copyright here, who would we grant it to? The AI is not a legal person, so it can't enforce the copyright, nor can it be enforced against. Giving the copyright to the programmer of the AI is also ill-advised, since, among other things, the programmers already enjoy copyright protection on the code that operates the AI. Could we instead give the copyright to me, the uh, user who made a simple prompt? Also no, because I merely contributed an idea, and copyright doesn't protect ideas, it only protects expressions. My second example goes to partially generated AI work. So what if instead of merely prompting an AI to write congressional testimony, I instead direct it with multiple iterative prompts. I give it a topic, 
Uh, I give it the t points that I'd like to make, conclusions I'd like to reach, tweak it back and forth, give it a time limit. Then I uh, take the resulting testimony, select a few sentences, delete the rest, and drop those sentences into a draft I've written up separately. Now this example involves a lot more human intervention and contribution such that the resulting testimony might be said to be imbued with my own original intellectual conceptions. In this case, I'm likely to get, and I should get, a copyright because first, I'm a human and I can be incentivized by the protections that copyright offers. Second, I've arguably made sufficient interventions and contributions and exercised sufficient control over the project such that we can view the resulting work as the product of my creativity and efforts. So I'll circle back to where I began to conclude that I'd see no call for legislative action at this time where the copyrightability issues currently presented by AI-generated works can be competently handled via a combination of statutory interpretation and federal litigation. Now, I'll concede that the Copyright Office's disclose and disclaim approach, in which a human author may have to disclose the involvement of AI and then disclaim portions of the work attributed to the AI, necessarily involves some tricky line drawing, but there's nothing revolutionary or disruptive about a case-by-case -case approach to copyright registration. And we've only seen four cases so far. Uh, the Copyright Office also received over 10,000 comments and result to a call on these questions. In other words, we're still very much in the learning phase, so we don't know what type of legislative intervention, if any, would be helpful or called for at this time. I'll also note that the courts have proven adept at interpreting and applying copyright law in the context of so-called disruptive or novel technologies, from time shifting to digitization of books to APIs. None of these technologies necessitated a new categorical rule, and AI doesn't either. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. I thank you. I, I might note that we have a long history of, of wanting to prevent excessive uh, litigation. Uh, I know that may not be uh, welcomed by everyone uh, on the bar, but that is another part of, uh, of what we do. So. That second part of what you said was most interesting, that the courts could take care of it with litigation. Mr. Landau. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. CCIA has been at the forefront of technology policy issues for more than 50 years, and our members are at the forefront of artificial intelligence technology today. They make the chips that AI runs on, they develop leading edge AI models, and they use AI to solve problems for their customers. It's critical that we protect American innovation while preventing the abuse of intellectual property protections over AI output. But if we look to existing law, we can find the balance that we need. In 1966, the Register of Copyrights was facing a difficult issue. Computer technology was becoming more widespread and sophisticated. People were beginning to apply for copyright protection for creative works made by computers. The Register wrote, it is certain that both the number of works proximately produced or written by computers and the problems of the Copyright Office in this area will increase. Fortunately, the Register also had an answer, and it was a good one. The Register identified the determinative question, whether the work is basically one of human authorship, with the computer merely being an assisting instrument, or whether the traditional elements of authorship in the work were actually conceived and executed, not by man, but by a machine. The Register's approach 60 years ago remains the right approach today. And the same inquiry would apply to patentable inventions. Was the invention one conceived of by human ingenuity with the AI operating as an assistive tool? Or was the invention generated exclusively by the AI system? When a machine is responsible for the traditional elements of creation, the original expression of an artistic work, or the generation of an invention, then intellectual property rights are inappropriate. When the machine simply supports human authorship or invention, then copyright or patent protection should remain available. With that guiding principle in mind, many questions regarding AI output and IP protection become easier to answer. Completely human creations remain protectable. Completely AI creations should not. There will be difficult questions in the center of that continuum where humans and AI collaborate to create and invent, but the answers there lie in existing law, in the law of inventorship and authorship, and in the Register's focus on whether a human was truly the creative or inventive entity. Those difficult questions will require attention. For example, if an inventor uses AI as a tool to develop a new invention, when does it cross the line from collaboration to the human simply taking the AI's work as their own? The existing law of inventorship can guide us. Someone who provides background information or explains the state of the art isn't an inventor. 
nor as someone who simply suggests a desired goal and doesn't contribute to the solution of the problem. The courts are suited well to developing these basic, long-standing principles to address future uses of AI. Beyond the availability of IP protection for AI output, AI tools will continue to impact other areas of the law. For example, in patent law, the question of obviousness rests on whether a person of ordinary skill with the relevant prior art available could have created the invention. This is fundamentally similar to how many AI systems operate. The availability of AI as a tool to aid an invention thus raises the level of ordinary skill in the art. If Albert Einstein, me, and my six-year-old son can each ask an AI tool for the answer to a problem, and we all get the same answer, it's hard to argue that any of us has invented anything that we should be allowed to patent. Outside of the legal system, there are potential policy problems if we make AI output eligible for IP protection. Already, more than half of US patents are issued to foreign inventors. These inventors can and do assert their patents against American companies. The PTO was even forced to change its trademark rules to deal with a flood of inaccurate and potentially fraudulent trademark applications from China. If AI output is patentable, a foreign adversary might employ the same tactic, flooding the patent office with AI-generated inventions. This will either overwhelm the office's resources or result in even more cases of foreign entities weaponizing patents against the American economy. In either case, granting patents for AI output presents significant concerns. Finally, we should bear in mind that the constitutional purpose of copyright and patent protection isn't to provide economic rewards. It's to promote the progress of science and useful arts. The rewards are a means to that end. But AI doesn't require the same economic, economic incentives people may. AI will undoubtedly become a part of the ordinary process of invention and creation. But as the Register of Copyrights recognized almost 60 years ago, and as the courts and agencies have continued to recognize today, it's essential that we ensure AI remains an adjunct to human creativity, not a replacement for it. This approach will protect American creativity and innovation, including in the field of AI. I thank the subcommittee for its time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Laporte. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee, I'm honored by your invitation to speak today. My name is Claire Laporte. I'm testifying today on behalf of Ginkgo Bioworks, a biotechnology company in Boston. We're publicly traded, and we work to use biology to solve problems in industries ranging from agriculture to chemicals to human therapeutics. And we're heavily invested in developing and using AI in our work. I'm going to use my five minutes to make three basic points. The first one, I think, is quite uncontroversial, and that is that biotechnology is a critically important technology for our national security and global competitiveness. Um, that is, I think, one thing that pretty much every uh, country around the world agrees on, so I'm not going to dwell on that now. My second point is that there is no need to panic over the role of AI, at least in the biotechnology space. We are far from having anything that is solely AI generated. And we don't know what that would even look like in the future. I've got three subpoints here. The first one is that in biology, AI is really just the latest step in a gradual technology evolution. Biology has been working hand in hand with computer science for decades. And in fact, we have a whole field that you can get a PhD in called computational biology that teaches you how to use these kinds of tools that we've been working on for a long time. The second subpoint in this part of my uh, point is that in biology, you don't need to worry about AI developing things that are fanciful or untrue, which I know is a concern in the, uh, the, the copyright space. Um, a text-based AI system like ChatGPT can come up with stuff that is crazy or false, but biology operates in the real world, and so there is a real biophysical constraint on the outputs. The output of the AI will be used to make a physical thing, which then has to be tested by a human, usually come, you know, that has figured out how to test that thing, and the results either do work or they don't work. If they don't work, you discard them. If they do work, that is a helpful development along what is usually a multi-step, very complex pathway in developing something that is extremely difficult. Third, AI has to be prompted by humans. We are very, very far away from anything in which you could um, ask uh, an AI to do something like cure cancer or whatever. That is an immense multi-step problem. It 
goes off in many different directions, there's absolutely no way that that can happen. In fact, solving engineering problems is extremely difficult, and humans have to be carefully trained uh, in their discipline to be able to direct AI tools, at least in biology, to create anything worthwhile. And again, it always needs to be tested to see if it works, because if it's sort of fanciful or ridiculous, it won't. So the takeaway here for my second point is that AI can be transformative by helping us do research faster, cheaper, and more predictably, but it is definitely not steering itself to come up with biological inventions. Okay, third point. There is no need to complicate our already complicated patent system by adding new inventorship regulations and by doing so adding yet another complication and step to our already overburdened litigation process. The patent system has, uh, the, the, sorry, the patent office has recently uh, released new guidelines on AI and inventorship that I think are likely to cause exactly that kind of difficulty and complication. Under current US inventorship law, conception, having the inventive idea, is the touchstone of inventorship. That can only be done by a human. The AI is simply crunching through unimaginably large data sets to come up with possible answers based on things that people have done before. The creativity is in the person crafting the prompt and getting the AI to sort of grow and winnow through that mass of data uh, in a particular direction. The Patent Act expressly provides that patentability shall not be negated by the manner in which the invention was made, but the new regulations are doing essentially that. You can have an invention that, if invented by old school methods, would be patentable, but if invented with the help of AI, might not be, and that is a completely nonsensical result. Our patent system and our patent litigation system are both way too complicated as it is. I think that at this point we are not in a position where we should be adding more complexity that potentially hurts our global competitiveness in comparison to other countries that are not so concerned about these issues of inventorship. So my view is if we've invented something great using AI, let's celebrate that, not penalize it. Thank you, and I look forward to the questions. Oops, I thank all of our witnesses. We now go to Mr. Fitzgerald for the first round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 140 years ago, the Supreme Court, in issuing its opinion on the cop copyrightability of the, of the photograph, stated, quote, the human intelligence can produce nothing without material assistance. And whether it's a tool, a machine, or another's hand, it is always uh, the thought of the artist uh, which directs the instrument, which guides and inspires the material means. Uh, I think that opinion is kind of incredibly important for our discussion today because just as artists embrace the camera as a creative tool, they have also begun to embrace the use of uh, generative AI. Uh, and just as human involvement is required in the copyright of a uh, photograph, so too must a human be involved obviously in the use of AI as a creative tool. And I think what we're discussing here today is uh, the amount of involvement required, right? to grant uh, a copyright. So the Copyright Office in its semi-annual ruling in Zaharia of the dawn denied copyright because of the generative AI tool used mid-journey. Um, it did not allow the artist to exercise ultimate creative control, instead comparing it to uh, a client who may just hire an artist to possibly create an image for them. Uh, Ms. A. Stars, did the Copyright Office get it right in this case, um, or, you know, what should ultimate creative control look like? What, what, what do you think about that? Thank you for the question. Um, I believe the relevant inquiry should be whether the work is the artist's own intellectual conception, as you referred us to the uh, decision in, um, in the Cerrone case, Burrogals versus Cerrone, uh, emphasized that an artist uh, engages with the tools that they use, and that's what we should be looking to. And what the Copyright Office is doing in asking artists to look at um, their work and to pick the work apart and to demonstrate control over a tool um, and explain um, uh, how... Uh, the, how much is being used rather than focus on the quality 
of the engagement um, is problematic to me. Uh, I think the inquiry should be a qualitative test because that is what Feist uh, and Cerrone are asking us uh, to do already. Uh, those are the Supreme Court cases that, uh, that we should be focusing on. So again, the relevant inquiry should be whether the work is of the artist's own intellectual conception and at least minimally creative, um, just as it always has been. So um, some will say that the Copyright Office is more focused on, on really the input of the artist versus the output by the program itself, and so how, I think, do, I think how do you think they find the, balance? They're doing the opposite, actually. Yeah. They're looking at the, uh, they're not looking at the input of the artist, they're looking at the output of the program, and they're, they're asking the artist to pick apart the, uh, the end result and say, disclose and disclaim, you know, all of, uh, you know, where we, where we see uh, the AI tool making contributions. And what I'm saying is, let's talk about the artist's intellectual conception. Let's talk about what the artist has done in their creative process. That's what matters here, is the artist's intellectual conception, the artist's process. Um, has the artist made a uh, at least minimally creative contribution uh, what's that spark of creativity that Feist asks us to look for? Where is that from the artist? Yeah, a lot of times, uh, uh, um, it's been referred to many times, but Jackson Pollock would create uh, his paintings, obviously, by some type of uh, creative process where, where he would approach the canvas in the way that he does. But the final product is still copyrightable because the artist has exercised kind of this modicum of uh, creativity, uh, which is the, uh, the standard under copyright law. What, why, sh why do you think that, why should copyright be denied simply because of the AI-generated output uh, is random or unpredictable, you know, based on how the artist creates? So I don't, I, 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 uh... I don't uh, think that there is randomness uh, necessarily implied by using a GAI tool any more than there is randomness implied by using any other tool or media by an artist. I think we should look at what the artist's process is. When an artist decides to create a work, an artist typically has a preconception for a work, an idea in their mind. What what uh, do they want to convey to the world? And they approach their, their work with that spirit in mind, um, and then they decide what tool are they going to pick up? Are they going to pick up a paintbrush? Are they going to pick up um, a, uh, a, 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 a engage with an AI, right? Um, and what is, what is their creative process going to look like as they move through that? Um, through that engagement, whatever that tool is. And I guess what I'm saying to the committee is um, we, shouldn't, we should have a sort of technologically neutral approach as to what tool the artist is choosing. We should instead be asking what is the artist doing? I'm out of, I'm out of time, but think, I yield back, Chairman. I thank the gentlelady for her thorough answer to that question. <laughs> we now go to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Garcia, because generative AI models are trained on mass corpuses of human creators' works, AI outputs are inextricably linked to human creativity. Can you walk us through how pending litigation about the fair use doctrine might or might not affect whether AI-generated outputs are copyrightable? And also give us a little more color to your opinion that um, legislative intervention uh, is not uh, really uh, appropriate at this particular time. That causes me to be a little queasy about ceding legislative authority to um, uh, the courts or to um, uh, regulators. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll start with the first part of the question, which asked about what effect this pending litigation around whether or not the training, let's call it data, 
uh, is going to constitute copyright infringement. I think that it could have um, important ramifications for this question, namely because if it turns out that uh, fair use does not apply and that the use of copyrighted works without authorization to train these large language models constitutes copyright infringement, that would mean that the products produced by those artificial intelligence uh, platforms would not be copyrightable because we don't copyright uh, works that are infringed. Infringing works are not copyrightable. So that would be significant, regardless of who we decided we might want to assign the copyright to, including to the user who just gives a prompt. So I think that would be significant. And to clarify and talk a bit further about my suggestion that we don't need le legislative intervention at this time, I really want to emphasize at this time because I don't think we know yet what we want. And I say this because we have um, these four generative AI related uh, registration determinations from the Copyright Office, two of them, only two of which deal with the more interesting question, I think, of partially generated AI works, right, where we have this disclaim, uh, disclose and disclaim approach that we've been mentioning. And I think that both, neither of those examples are quite the example that I want, so I would like to see more so that we get a better idea of sort of the things that Professor Iostars was alluding to, which is how do we determine if we are going to be looking at inputs as opposed to outputs, what is our standard going to be? I agree that it's going to necessarily be subjective and a bit case by case, but if we want legislative guidance around what the, should be involved in those subjective analyses, I just think we don't know yet what to ask for. Thank you. Uh, Professor Eisters, you. do you have anything to add uh, to what uh, Ms. Garcia has said or anything that you uh, want to comment on? about what she has said. So, so I think uh, you know, if we were going to talk about training of, of the AI tools and uh, fair use uh, applicability to those tools, we would have a very lengthy conversation and uh, Chairman Issa would cut me off. So I will restrain myself <laughs> from answering those questions. Um, I, I do think there are some very important questions that need to be answered about the training of tools, and I personally um, am uh, uh, very doubtful that um, the courts will be able to find that the training of those tools uh, is um, uh, excusable with fair use arguments. Uh, but I, I think at some point, somehow, we will resolve um, how those tools are being trained. Um, and uh, we will, at, in some way, somehow, move on to the conversation we're having today, which is how do users use those tools uh, and what happens with um, the artwork, the creative works that are generated through the use of those tools by users. Um, and I think uh, Professor Garcia and I uh, are, are trying to have that conversation sort of separating the, the training of the data sets um, issue from Okay, that. thank you. Mr. Gar Mr. Landau, 20 seconds. I think that fundamentally it comes back to the idea of was the human the essential creator of the artistic expression, or was it the computer? So if the... Uh, How could you tell? That's a good question. There's some difficulty in telling, but it's the same kind of question we've asked for... It's going to be the honor system? No, I think it's the same kind of question we've asked for decades at this point as to what portion of a work is protectable and what isn't. I think of the, the Nike Jumpman logo. There was litigation over that because somebody else reproduced a similar photo, the idea of a basketball player floating in the air, but it wasn't infringement because it was their own expression of that idea. So that expression is the key if you're just giving the AI the idea of give me a picture of a basketball player floating in the air, that's not enough to generate a copyright for you. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, I, I will note by the way that we have had a series and will have a series more of round tables. So if I, if I ask you to stay as close as possible to that zero number, it's only because we have members coming in and out in a short time today, but I suspect many of you will be invited back to those roundtables in the near future. We then go to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to follow up on the questioning of Mr. Johnson, particularly Ms. Garcia, with regard to the legal landscape for patent inventorship and a concern that uh, the PTO guidelines that have been issued are not statutory. They are uh, simply advisory and that courts can go in a completely different direction if they wish. And you don't see any, any con concern about um, the fact that the guidance leaves unclear the process the PTO will use to make determinations about human and AI inventorship. Um, uh, for example, the PTO doesn't typically question or examine whether a patent application correctly listed the inventors, uh, doesn't require any evidence about inventorship to be submitted. Uh, so uh, what are the ramifications to both the examination process and the resulting patent? And can the courts take this in a, in a fundamentally different direction than the guidelines? Thank you for the question. Um, I want to preface my answer uh, by clarifying that I'm really speaking to the Copyright Office and it's um, the guidance that it's released thus far relating to registration determinations around copyrightable material. So I, I don't want to speak out of turn to my, my uh, more patent-focused colleagues. Um, but yes, I share the concern that right now um, it sounds like comparably on both the patent and the copyright side, uh, the guidance is you know, not the strongest guidance. It's not really giving us a lot of clarity right now. I think what I am rather saying is not that we'll not need any legislative um, intervention. It's just that I wouldn't know what to ask you for yet. Um, like I said, the Copyright Office at least recently issued a, a, a public call for comments on copyrightability and AI. And it got over 10,000 responses, which is more, much more than normal. Um, and it will be interesting to see what the outcome of that review looks like and where people are landing. I'm hoping that we've got lots of answers from different artists as to what they think uh, their creative processes look like and where they think the lines should be drawn. Um, and then, you know, my thought would be once we have more guidance on that, we would be able to get something legislative that would, would enforce whatever the Copyright Office has determined. I want to come back to copyright, but let me give uh, Mr. Landau and Ms. Laporte uh, the opportunity to respond to that. I'll give it a try. Um, I have a lot of concern about the complications in the system that can come from making inquiry into the role of AI in biological inventions anyway, uh, something that becomes very important. Um, I'm a patent litigator. I did that for decades, and I can tell you right now that every case is now going to have a new layer, just based on what the, the new guidance that the patent office has issued, a new layer of litigation about what tools did you use, um, how much AI did you consult, and also, what about the old computational biology tools? Because the new guidance, by the way, does not define AI, and so it could be anything. And so, you know, we already have layer after layer after layer of complication in patent litigation, and I worry that it just makes the system unworkably expensive. It makes it, I think, a competitive disadvantage for us. Um, well, let's play devil's advocate. Could AI be used to read through millions of patents to determine if any were granted by mistake? And if so, what would happen then? Well, uh, I, I think that um, once the patent office empowers AI searching for examiners, it may improve patent quality. So I actually think that the use of AI in engineering disciplines is a, a, a very significant benefit, um, both for examination and for invention purposes. I think it stands to help us get ahead competitively, and I think we should just be careful not to do anything that's going to inhibit the use of it. Well, what if it's a foreign adversary that wants to eat away at our patents and they employ AI to review U.S. granted patents? Could that lead to more patent challenges in court? And to what extent is China's utilization of AI and its patent system influencing practices within the U.S. patent system, especially as it relates to the biotech industry? Uh, so far, I don't think that we're seeing much impact at all. Um, the, the things that have to be done for China to challenge patents are very cumbersome and expensive and one-off. So if you want to challenge a granted U.S. patent, you have to challenge it in the PTAB, which is not an easy or inexpensive process. So I'm actually not so concerned about that, particularly because there isn't a competitive reason for that to occur in most cases. I mean, certainly I think that AI is going to raise the stakes on pretty much everything that happens because it's going to increase the accuracy and quality of what is done in examination and in the inventing process to begin with. But I think that we should welcome that 
shift, and I don't think that there is so much of a risk of sort of massive amounts of anything coming from China that it, it, that it merits uh, making a change in policy as a result. Thank you. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in one sense, this, this uh, hearing has been very interesting. You are all essentially advising us to do nothing, which sometimes is Congress's best, uh, best for that position. <laughs> let me ask you, uh, Professor Garcia, in your testimony, you outlined many legal reasons why predominantly AI-generated works do not warrant copyright protection. Some may argue, however, that denying AI-generated works protection will only incentivize applicants to conceal their use of AI altogether. How do you think we should balance the legal reasons to deny protection with that practical policy concern? Thank you for the question. Um, that's certainly one of, among other moral hazards to such a policy. I think that the, the downsides of issuing copyright to wholly or substantially generated AI, AI works outweigh the, uh, the possible consequences of folks just, uh, um, uh, sort of covering up AI's involvement. Um, I might be an optimist, but I would, I, I'm hope, hopeful that uh, the uh, documents that applicants have to sign saying that they've submitted truthful applications um, might deter some of that. And on the other side, if we, are, if we really started issuing copyrights to all of the outputs that an AI generates, we would have a massive influx of copyrights, right? Because it can, in a matter of a half hour, produce thousands of works, um, and uh, pretty soon no one can draw a cat in a tub, because I put cat in a tub and got you know, 8,000 different versions of cat in a tub, and there's none left. Um, that to me, uh, along with the fact that like, who would we enforce against if one of those cat in the tubs infringes another person's uh, work, seem to me like sort of bigger and more imminent issues than people being dishonest on their applications. Thank you. Professor Eistos, do you agree? I think I generally do agree with that analysis. Um, I think, you know, there's also the backstop of um, prohibitions uh, against um, being, uh, against including inaccurate information with, no with knowledge in a copyright registration form. And so since we're all on knowledge that we are supposed to, at least for the time being, um, disclose and disclaim uh, AI uh, use. Uh, I think that will be uh, helpful to us and the Unicolors decision um, uh, at the Supreme Court, uh, I think, doesn't really help registrants all that much in, in, this, uh, in this case. Thank you. Mr. Landau. You have argued that if AI output is patentable, foreign adversaries could flood the patent office with AI-generated output, overwhelming the agency. But triaging and reviewing applications requires tremendous resources, even if the applications are ultimately rejected. So why should the PTO's AI guidance have any impact on the potential flood of applications? So I think that the PTO's AI guidance will mostly operate to for the people who are not trying to trick the PTO. It will mostly operate for people who are in good faith trying to get their innovation through the office. The problem is that even if the guidance is in force, and the PTO at this point, at least in the guidance, has nothing in there that affirmatively asks. The examiner has to decide to ask, was AI used in some way? Even having that affirmative ask up front in the application data sheet as part of the application process would be a good step forward in putting the uh, applicant on record. And there are tools that they used in the trademark context uh, about five years ago where they were receiving this flood of fraudulent applications. They put into place task force, they, did, they increased their random audits to provide a sort of backstop to the uh, to try and detect these fraudulent applications. Thank you. Ms. Laporte, some commentators have raised concern that current U.S. conception law, that is the point at which an invention is deemed to have been conceived, could, if too narrowly uh, construed, deprive human inventors of legitimate patent rights in their inventions. They caution that this would put the United States at a disadvantage to the rest of the world. 
Is this a reasonable concern? And if so, how should Congress seek to prevent this kind of misapplication? I think that it is a reasonable concern to think that if we overregulate uh, by requiring AI disclosures and things of that kind, that we could actually inhibit uh, legitimate inventions. Um, there are so many steps and so much human creativity that is actually involved in directing AI toward an engineering task that I think that the the that the the risk of inhibiting invention is the greater risk that we should focus on. So again, we shouldn't do anything here. Uh, well, it would be a good thing to get rid of the current patent office guidelines because I think that those open up a Pandora's box of potential litigation complications that can cause problems for inventions that are perfectly legitimate and meet all the statutory criteria, the many statutory criteria that invention needs to meet to be patentable. I think adding another layer on puts us at a big competitive disadvantage because, again, you know, if, if, if somebody makes an invention in an old-timey way, it's patentable, but if we make it in a modern way using AI, then it's not patentable. Why is that a good result? It doesn't make any sense. I think it puts us at a competitive disadvantage because other economies are not worried so much about who the inventor is. They're just worried about making sure that they patent inventions that should be patented. And I think that that's the focus we also should have. Thank you. My time's expired. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from California, Mr. Kiley. Uh, there's a very important distinction, I think, between the two uh, areas we've been talking about today, copyrights and patents, uh, which you alluded to in your testimony, uh, Ms. Laporte, which is that you know, with, uh, it's a different paradigm of creativity versus usefulness. Uh, with a copyright, you're really talking about it's all about creativity, whereas <clears throat> an invention uh, is measured against its uh, usefulness. Uh, in the real world. And so that, I think, argues for treating these uh, two areas in a, in a different way and perhaps having a more searching inquiry into the act of creation and copyright uh, as opposed to, to patents, where there's, simp there's, there's just a different standard. Um, and, you know, we already have uh, in our system uh, a lot of complications and ambiguity and confusion when it comes to patent subject matter uh, eligibility. Uh, that's been introduced uh, by the courts, and we know that that has, in some ways, chilled um, invention and investment uh, in emergent fields uh, because of the uncertainty of being able to be rewarded uh, for your invention. And so I'm concerned about what this guidance and this whole new uh, inquiry of sort of looking under the hood uh, of the inventive process uh, is going to mean as far as uh, exacerbating those problems and thereby uh, limiting invention, limiting usefulness. I'm trying to imagine what discover, discovery will even look like when you now have this new tool to invalidate a patent saying, oh no, you crossed the line of using too much AI uh, in, in such a way as to invalidate it and what that's going to look like when we're having these inquiries uh, into the process uh, of invention. So I wanted to, uh, Ms. Laporte, uh, give you an, an, another opportunity to sort of draw out what the implications of this uh, might be. You just said it's going to reduce our competitiveness. Do you see this maybe leading inventors or companies to forego the most efficient or most effective process uh, in developing a drug or whatever the case may be for fear that that will then uh, you know, lead to a great, more vulnerable patent? Sorry, I had it on. Um, yes, I do think that there is that risk. Um, if you have to worry that your patent might be invalid because of the fact that you use the most efficient modern tools to develop your invention, that is, of course, a disincentive both to using it and to disclosing it if you do use it. And so to me, that imparts um, a level of inefficiency to our system that I do worry puts us at a competitive disadvantage. To get a patent, you have to meet a lot of statutory criteria. You pointed to utility. Um, it also has to be novel, it has to be non-obvious, it has to be enabled, it has to be adequately described. And of course, the process of description is something that's very important because you need to, at least in the biotech context, you can't get a patent without describing how you tested the thing that you invented and that it worked. Um, and, and so there are so many hurdles already to patentability, which is reasonable and valid, there should be. I mean, we shouldn't be able to grant a patent unless it's a good patent, but once it has actually met that standard, let's have that be patentable. 
And so there was uh, some uh, discussion, um, I think it was from Mr. Landau actually, related to um, the, that, the fact, fact that you just cited of non-obviousness, how that's a uh, requirement for patentability and how the availability of new tools uh, such as AI uh, is sort of baked into the non-obviousness inquiry because an ordinary person, a person of ordinary skill is gonna have access to AI tools. So if the availability of AI tools is already baked into the non-obviousness inquiry, uh, which is something that you know is, is its own separate requirement, uh, then why is it that we need to uh, further inquire uh, as to you know, the extent to which there was a human AI combination or too much of one, too much of the other in the process? I'll give you and Mr. Landau if you'd like a chance to, uh, to opine on that. Uh, sure. So I think that the difference is that our laws say that humans can be inventors and non-humans cannot. It's the same as in the copyright context. So we do need to inquire into who the actual inventor is. But I don't think this is a particularly new thing. We have had inventorship disputes and litigation for probably as long as we've had a patent system. It's an ordinary part of patent litigation. It's an ordinary part of patent prosecution that you swear that you were the inventor. So I don't think that it's a, a huge ask of an applicant to say, do you swear that you truly conceived this invention? Ms. Laporte, did you have something to add on that? I, th I think that the fact that an invention has to be non-obvious means that as everybody begins to use AI, it will improve patent quality by giving much greater access to examiners to things that they can look at to understand what the closest prior art is. And so, yes, I think that it has the potential to improve patent quality and that we do not need, as a result of that, to include the additional sort of layer of bureaucracy and complication that is now being imposed by the current patent office guidance. I think that that should be rescinded. I think that at this point, at least when it comes to biological inventions, there's absolutely no chance that you can just sort of prompt AI to create something, uh, or, or even have it create something unprompted, as Stephen Thaler claims. So I, I am very, very skeptical uh, about the need for this additional regulation, and I do worry that it hurts us in the long run, given the fact that we're the only country that focuses on it in this way. Thank you, my time has expired. Thank you, the gentleman. We now recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Ross, for her questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the witnesses for sharing your expertise with us. Um, many companies and startups in the Research Triangle area in North Carolina, which I represent, utilize AI to accelerate innovation, as Ms. Laporte has talked about. For instance, to sort through large databases of genes and speed up analyses of uh, proteins and molecules. They use AI as a tool to assist with the development they have done for decades. Uh, this assistance could make an enormous difference for people with cancer or for kids with rare diseases and so many others that are waiting for treatments for their conditions to come to market quicker and more cheaply. The bottom line is that the use of AI in biotech, pharmaceutical, and medical research and development can help people who are suffering get help faster. And I firmly believe that IP protections should be extensive enough to incentivize investors to utilize new technologies like AI to accelerate their research and bring their innovations to market as quickly as possible. The USPTO's guidance released last year affirms this stance, but we've heard some um, problems with it, potentially. Um, but it does provide that inventors may obtain patents for inventions as long as the human contribution to the product is significant. And I'm grateful for all of your expertise. I'd like to stay with Ms. Laporte for my line of questioning because I really want to focus on patents and the sciences. Um, you've talked about what's going on in the U.S. and alluded to what's going on in other countries, but I'd like you to share any statutory or regulatory approaches in AI and IP in other countries that might be either considered or avoided by the United States, and whether we um, need to do anything to remain competitive on a global stage. 
Well, I'm only admitted to practice in the United States, <laughs> and so I think as to details, I should probably get back to you uh, after the fact. I, I will say, however, that having uh, directed uh, global litigation, sometimes I would be involved in being U.S. counsel for a company that was also being sued or was suing in, in many other jurisdictions around the world that I think that our system is uniquely complicated and that that puts sort of a, a, a tax on innovation and the use of innovation that we don't need. Uh, and so um, I do think that what you said in your opening statement is exactly right, that we need to focus on how we can most incentivize the use of the very best tools to come up with the best inventions. And just to sort of add to that a little bit, um, you know, uh, the way that antibodies were developed, many of them are are, are manufactured in your district. Um, the way that antibodies have traditionally been developed is by immunizing a mouse with the target antigen. And then you screen the antibodies that the mouse's body generates to find the ones that meet what you want. Under the current PTO office guidelines, you might have to perhaps disclose that the mouse had some inventive role. I mean, it's just not clear to me that there's any benefit in sort of trying to figure out how many angels can dance on the head of a pin when you have a useful invention that meets all the statutory criteria. Okay. Well, to, to follow up on that, um, some commentators advocate for a requirement that a applicants formally document inventor contributions, including details about the contributions of AI. Um, and I guess that could have also applied to other things in computational biology. Um, they argue that this would complement already common practices like maintaining a lab notebook. What do you think of this idea, and is your company documenting its use of AI in a manner like this? Certainly, we keep good records about what we, what the science we do and, and how we do it. Um, but I think that uh, inquiring into the uh, scientific practices and strategies of a company is something that inhibits the use of the patent system, because of course uh, the, the the specific approaches that you take, the 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 mental ways that you think about approaching a problem, those are all actually trade secrets or creative things that are not things that are disclosed when you. When you make an invention, you have to say how to make and use it. You do not need to say all about what your creative thought process was that went into how you make and use it. And so I think that we should not sort of try to expand the scope of those requirements. I very much appreciate um, your responses. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, I will take the liberty of going next to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Lofgren, for her question. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting and useful hearing. Um, and some of the things you've talked about I hadn't thought about before. Um, I think, you know, the Copyright Office is making good steps forward and trying to figure out where is that line. I think we all agree we need to protect the humans here in terms of their creativity, but where, you know, where's the line? If you give 15 prompts, is that enough? I think that's something that they're going to be able to come back to us with, and that will be very useful. In terms of um, the patent office, uh, Ms. Laporte, I think you've made a, a powerful case about the guidance, and it causes me some questions. For example, Google unfolded every protein in the human body and posted it for every scientist in the world to use. Would that violate the standards if, if, if people use that AI-generated information? Or in the case of fusion, right now people are using AI to understand the uh, actions of plasma interacting with targets to advance fusion. Would the use of AI to understand plasma run afoul of the guidance that the PTO has given? And also the Google question. Well, I'll, I'll have to defer on the, plas uh, on, on the plasma question because I'm not sure I fully understand the basis of that, but we can, I'm sure, get at this issue through the use of the tools relating to protein folding. Um, so uh, we now have very useful tools that can take a sequence and um, 
uh, tell you what expected structure of the protein is going to be. And those are tools that are now universally used by everybody, including, I would assume, patent examiners if a relevant question comes up, uh, because they're publicly available. So that, that, to me, just becomes part of um, what somebody now with ordinary skill in the art is definitely going to use. Um, those things are public. There's nothing that um, that gives one person an advantage over another uh, in inventing as a result of using a publicly available computational tool. And so I can't imagine any good reason why we wouldn't want everybody to use those who's trying to create something new and useful. So the answer really is the guidance would not apply if the um, AI-generated information is available to everybody, but wouldn't that be true of any use of AI? Because anybody could could use the tool. I, I think I may have misinterpreted your earlier question. So in, in terms of whether that should be disclosed, it seems to me that now, since it is a very commonly used tool, it might not even occur to people to disclose that. Um, however, I do think that, that part of what's happening in biology, at least, and I think probably in other engineering disciplines, is that in addition to there being publicly available AI tools, there are also companies that are develop, de developing their own private Argued, AI. Yeah. And so there may be some significant differences there uh, in, in terms of um, whether we have sort of a level playing field. Uh, right. So. I have a question. I think um, Ms. Garcia, and maybe it was you, I can't remember, who said that if the courts find that the use of the data for machine learning was infringing, that any use of AI would also then be infringing. Did I misunderstand that? What I said is if the training of the AI on copyrighted works is found not to be fair use such that it constitutes Correct. copyright infringement, any output of that language model trained on infringing content would be uncopyrightable because we don't copyright infringing. Okay, words. so I, I basically did understand it. Yes. Okay, so one of the things that I think, I agree that we ought to tread carefully that the PTO uh, and Copyright Office are working diligently. Here's a question whether we ought to deal with remedies. Because you know, I believe that if there was infringement on the data collection for learning, there ought to be compensation. But I do worry if there were injunctive relief so that AI in America w was enjoined, that would put us at a tremendous disadvantage versus China and others. Do you think we should consider whether we should direct the remedy towards monetary compensation as opposed to shutting down AI in America? Certainly from an innovation standpoint, I think that a remedy aimed at monetary damages makes a lot more sense. I, I'd also be hopeful that in, in addition to or alongside that we might see efforts toward um, uh, you know, careful, careful efforts, uh, very well-crafted efforts towards some sort of uh, what I call a liability rule or setting up a, a, a licensing scheme, right? To have, we have these all over copyright right. where we have collectives. Mandatory licensing of some uh, sort. Compulsory licensing, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. My time has expired. I thank the gentlelady. We now go to the gentleman from California, if he's ready, Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, AI has the potential to change our economy, our political system, our day-to-day -day life, and potentially in very good ways and also very disruptive ways. Uh, AI has opened a world of opportunity for creators, uh, whether that's utilizing pioneering technology to isolate vocal tracks or generate unique compositions that artists can incorporate into their works. But we have to balance technological advancement uh, with the protection of individual creators' rights, ensuring that progress does not come at the expense of the creative community. Uh, after all, human creativity powers AI and makes these advancements possible. Uh, as has been raised uh, during the hearing today, the rapid development of generative AI technologies has outpaced existing copyright laws, which has led to widespread use of creative content to train generative AI models without consent or compensation. Uh, as you were indicating, that might violate the copyright laws. This is why yesterday I introduced the Generative AI Copyright Disclosure Act, which will further innovation and safeguard the contribution of creators 
ensuring that at a minimum they are aware of when their work contributes to AI training data sets. Similar to proposals put forward in the EU, uh, my bill mandates transparency from companies by requiring they disclose a summary of copyrighted works used to train AI systems, ensuring creators are informed and have the tools to advocate for credit uh, or compensation where it's due. Uh, this bill is a step, uh, and only a first step, uh, in this direction, and I welcome the opportunity to work with members of the subcommittee to champion innovation while safeguarding the rights and contr contributions of creators. Uh, very grateful to have the support of many leading organizations in the creative industry, including the Human Artistry Campaign, Recording Industry Association of America, SAG-AFTRA, and IATSE, to name a few. Um, now that I've finished the commercial announcement, um, one primary concern many of these creative groups have is that generative AI models will replace writers in the writing room, actors on set, or artists in the recording studio. Uh, let me start, if I can, Professor Garcia, while new technologies like AI offer a breadth of advancements in the production space to utilize or partner with, what can creators, many of whose livelihood depends on copyright protection, expect in terms of AI authorship decisions from the Copyright Office? What do you anticipate? Thank you for the question. I think that given the guidance that we've seen so far, which as I mentioned uh, previously is a really small set, right? We've got four <laughs> such uh, generative AI um, produced works, registration determinations. Um, if the work is wholly or substantially generated by AI, they can expect that the Copyright Office will not grant protection. Where it's partially uh, AI generated, the Copyright Office, as we've been discussing, appears to be taking a disclose and disclaim approach, which is easier said than done, but the notion being that what would happen if you wanted to secure a copyright registration in a work for which an artist had used generative AI, they may have to first disclose that they've done so, and then second, make a good faith attempt to ex describe how much of the work was done by generative AI. And I think here a really important distinction to make that I've been seeing from questions and from testimony today is the difference between uh, using AI as a tool, much like a paintbrush, and generative AI, which is actually creating something new. And I think it's the latter that really adds challenges. Artists should not be concerned about using AI as a tool to aid in their creativity um, only when they're using generative AI to substitute for their creativity. And where do you uh, draw the line of human versus AI authorship? And how do you think that the specific material an AI model is trained on should be considered? And, and I would throw that open to the whole panel. Sure, so I'll start. I think that um, I wish I knew exactly where to draw the line. I'll, I'll say again that I'd love to see more of these um, uh, applications come in so we can see what people are doing with the generative AI to get a sense of it. If I had to give one criteria now, it would be to consider whether the final product reflects the original intellectual conception of a human. And if so, then I think I would lean toward granting copyright protection. Well, that, is, that is very hard to define, isn't it? Yes. Um, uh, would others care to weigh in? Sure. Uh, creativity is hard to define as well. So I think that this is part of part and parcel of copyright is how do we say that something is creative? How do we define creativity? In the context of AI, I agree with Professor Garcia completely that it's, was the human using it as a tool? I think it was the ranking member that mentioned Autotune, which is its own form of AI and has been used for, I don't know if it's decades now, but for quite a while. And we've seen similar tools in the patent context. Those tools are fine. The generative AI is where it can step over that line. And I don't think we have equivalents in the patent space yet, certainly not on the tech side, and I'm hearing not really on the bio side, where you just say, give me this, and it spits something out. If we get to that point, then that will become much more of an important question on patents. Right now, it's probably not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague. And I might note, I also thank him for the submission of his, his bill. And I know that yours and Mr. Klein's bills, as is forthcoming, uh, are going to be taken up by this subcommittee. So uh, I appreciate your thoughtful work on that. We now go to the gentleman from Maryland who's been so patient, Mr. Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, let me follow up on that line of questioning because I'm a little unsure about the, the, how we're trying to draw a line with respect to what's creative, with, when AI is a tool as opposed to when it's, um, 
you know, actually creating new work, I guess, of some sort. Um, because I, you know, I just came back from a conference and they were talking about generative AI as not creative and that it's actually a tool. Um, so, uh, Professor Garcia, let me come back to you because you, you talked a little bit about um, that line that you were drawing. Um, is, does that vary from you know, the type of works we're talking about? Uh, or where would you draw the line with respect to not only that distinction, but other types of uh, works? Let's say like art, music, biotech uh, investigation. How do you differentiate there? Thank you for the question. And I think that you've identified one of the primary challenges, particularly in the copyright space, is that copyright as an umbrella uh, statute tries to cover so many different types of works. And the use of generative AI and the use of AI tools looks dramatically different from visual arts to music to film and so forth. Um, again, I think that, uh, you know, I've tried to identify in my written testimony a few things like predictability and control, which I recognize can to some extent also be applied in the use of AI as tool, which I've suggested is okay uh, for copyrightability purposes. And here's an example I'd give. Um, one of our colleagues uh, had mentioned Jackson Pollock, I think, earlier, where if he just took a paintbrush and splashed it onto a canvas, he wouldn't be able to predict exactly what it would look like. Um, but I would argue, differently to giving a simple prompt to AI to like make a painting, he would have had more input, right? He picked the color of the paint and the force with which he splashed it and the angle at which he splashed it. So we could see Pollock in that work as opposed to me just telling Midjourney like make a painting. You, you've got a better eye for Pollock than I do, I guess. But, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, others on the panel, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? So if I, if I may, um, I think there may be some misunderstanding in terms of how artists actually engage with a tool like Midjourney, um, and also how artists develop uh, and engage with tools, any tools, over time. Um, and so that's why I say we start with the fact that it is an artist's intellectual conception, but then when we translate that idea over to the, con to the context of a GAI tool, which is in fact a two-way interaction between the human and the GAI, um, I'm suggesting that that intellectual uh, conception, um, what we're looking for next then is whether the artist um, is continuing that uh, intellectual uh, uh, conception um, in a matter that demonstrates that the artist is staying true to their creative vision. So the artist let is me, let me Let me pause you there. Um, okay, so I think we, I believe it was here. Um, the, the prompt was run, create a trailer for a science fiction movie of, you know, uh, Martian invasion or something, and it came up like that. Um, and I guess that's a generative AI tool. Um, and so the creative vision Right. I, I, I would argue that that is not a uh, intellectual conception and that is not a sufficient direction um, from the prompter to have uh, engaged the tool with an authentic creative voice that is right. conveying something of the artist. So let me ask you a follow-up question. Let's say the person who gave the initial prompt then says, change this and then change that. Uh, at what point does it move from being... Uh, does it become a creative uh, product for the artist as opposed to a, just a generative AI that would not get patent protect or copyright protection? Yeah, so that's actually not how the tools work. So you're not saying like change this, change that, like you might say as a creative art director to a client, a client commissioning an, art, uh, an artist to do something. You're actually often as the user of the tool giving prompts that say, I want to use, um, you know, this equivalent of this F-stop, uh, the equivalent me, of bond paper. Let me make it real easy. I, 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 to test out chat GPT, I said, um, generate a sermon by Martin Luther King. It came up in two seconds. If I then took that document, and there are a couple of them were explicit quotes, but mostly not. If I then took that document and edited it out, or even better, I said generate a, state, a speech by Glenn Ivey and then made changes to it, some editing. 
Wouldn't that at that point become a creative process that I had generated? Uh, so I would argue, no, you're actually saying to the tool, uh, infringe somebody's copyright. Well, it would uh, have been me, right? Pardon me? It would have been me, the, uh, the, my second. Oh, you example. said Martin Luther King. Well, Sorry. second one was me, Glenn Ivey. Right okay, here. so then in that case, you're asking to um, make a derivative work of your own work. So our inquiry would really not be so much whether you are... Um, whether you are uh, entitled to a copyright on the first work, but whether you've made sufficient changes to that second work right. to be entitled to it. So it's really not an AI issue as much as it is whether you've made changes to your second work that are sufficient for copyright in your second work. Well, I see I've run over my time, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I thank you, yeah. and you did it very well. I'm going to pick up, uh, recognize myself, and I'm going to pick up where uh, Mr. Ivey left off. We all agree that if uh, the Beatles remaster one of their works, it's still copyrighted, right? I get all yeses. Beatles remaster, but they use AI. Is it still copyrighted? So I'm getting mostly yeses. Ms. Garcia, you had earlier talked about, uh, to that point, uh, a, uh, let me make sure I get it right here. Uh, I put down remastered on, on your point because you were, you were talking about uh, original works that went into or were ingested into, if you will, AI. And you said something that was interesting. Ms. Lofgren, I thought, was going to go there. She didn't quite get to the point I had, which was if you, if you ripped off the work and then you create something, isn't the underlying copyright still there? In other words, this new product, which is a derivative with copyrighted material in it, to the extent that that is, and this is what Mr. Schiff has been working on, to the extent that you are in fact taking earlier copyright work and that those works are less than 70 years past the life of the author, aren't we still seeing a, a modicum of copyright in that product, meaning that you may have ripped it off, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that there wouldn't be some potential protection against just everybody else using it uh, themselves? Well, as I understand what you've described, this would be, uh, if, if, they, if you're using an, an AI that's been trained on infringing material, let's say, or material that's found to not be fair use, so it infringes. Is well, that... was, no, 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 no. Again, you use the term fair use, and I'm, use, I'm, I'm drifting off of what you, you said. Okay. Let's assume that it isn't fair use, then it is, in fact, copyrighted material. Let's not assume the word ripped off for a moment. Let's simply say it is contained. Mm -hmm. To the extent that libraries are built using copyrighted material, and Ms. A stairs, I'm going to use the Getty Library. Okay, all that massive amount of video and, and, uh, and still pictures. To the extent that that's ingested and then something is created, A, Getty is going to tell me, as they have, hey, you owe me. You don't have the right to steal it, but you owe me. Mm -hmm. To the extent that the output would not give in a copyright if they're given no copyright, then where are we going to get the revenue from for that? In a sense, don't we have an obligation to look at, and I'm going to go particularly to Ms. A, Ms. Stairs for a reason, to the extent that we're using the video, visual uh, art that we have so much of, we have an obligation, I would say, to have an inducement of value if we want to have those derivative creations. Otherwise, there won't be those derivative creations if you have to pay on the input and you can't monetize on the output. Wouldn't you agree that at least in principle that's one of the challenges that this body that isn't supposed to do any, any legislating here, according to all four of you, probably has to look at? I, I'm asking you because it's sort of more your, your end of the business. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I began by saying that we, uh, we need to resolve the liability issue for training so that we aren't relegating these classes yeah. of and, works. And and I, we can't resolve it here today, and that's one of the reasons that I'm simply saying to the extent that it's not fair use, that in fact there has to be some sort of 
uh, revenue process to the original creators. Now, that, those revenue processes are unlikely to be on the ingest side. They're more likely to be on the output side. And that's one of the challenges that this committee is, is looking at and anticipating is that copyrighted material, if we don't grant a copyright to output material, then we don't have the ability to compensate the input and it, it, it favors the case of saying, well, it's fair use then. Yeah. Why, why don't you think about that for a question? I'm gonna come back to you. Yeah. I wanna go over the other side real quick. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, uh, and you, uh, Ms. LaCourte, you said, you used the word prompt a couple of times. And one of the questions, since you do not think the current guide, guidance from the PTO is, is, is good, it's one of the things that you asked us to do during this hearing is maybe to undo it. Isn't it practice, typically in patents, that when you're describing your invention and you have all your little charts, uh, maybe not always in your, your regime, but in electronics, we almost always, we show, you know, in my era, we showed a slide rule and an abacus, but today they, they show the computer, they show uh, other, other instruments. In a sense, isn't what the patent office should be saying is, tell us your prompts and tell us the AI library that you used so that in fact somebody of ordinary skill can one, duplicate, and two, verify whether or not it falls under obviousness based on a limited number of prompting or relatively large amount of prompting and how the AI model would have dealt with it. So we're not patenting our AI tools. We're patenting specific genetic constru constructs that we make using the tools. So the outcome of what we do is likely to be a DNA sequence of some kind which no, I understand that. The reason I was asking, though, is that, one, you have to disclose to somebody of ordinary skill. You have to disclose how to make and use the invention. It right. doesn't mean that you, you have also have an obviousness test. And so the patent office is, con is concerned about large use of generative AI ultimately creating uh, patents that are applied for that are basically machine created and therefore obvious to anyone who has the machine. So back to the question, which was fairly, I wanted to make it fairly nar narrow. Shouldn't the patent office, rather than the test that they're giving, simply say that as we have done in patents for generations, the, the tools used are disclosed often, and in this case, the prompts requested to the extent that they are digital prompts, uh, you know, be, I mean, I was a musician who's, who's playing an uh, electronic piano, can't really define his prompts. But you can define the prompts you gave as part of the process, couldn't you? Not necessarily. I think particularly given the fact that we are all likely to be developing uh, proprietary AI systems um, using proprietary data, and while my company is very interested in trying to make sure that there's as much data sharing as possible, uh, we all still develop things uh, along slightly different pathways, and I think that... Well, the I appreciate that, but that's one of the questions I have, which is my obligation is to make sure that all industries disclose that which allows someone of ordinary skill not someone of ordinary skill with your special sauce that isn't disclosed to duplicate the process later. That becomes a very important point in, in granting of patents is we are in fact granting patents not so you can be enriched, but so in fact 20 years later, society shall be enriched. Absolutely, but the, the thing is that what we, the, the invented thing is going to be a biological construct not software, not AI. We are using the AI to solve a biological problem, and what we're patenting is the solution to the biological problem. So you can absolutely use that thing 20 years after the patent is applied for. It will be open source, anybody will be able to use that thing, and it's easy to make. The things that we make 
are typically, well, sometimes they're very hard to make, but often the, the, the like if I make a new enzyme, for example, um, it's easy to be able to teach somebody how to make and use that enzyme, and I do not need to teach them how the AI that I prompted and what data I used and everything else, that is irrelevant to being able to make and use the invention. I appreciate that. Briefly, have you had time to come back with how, how I should deal with this, this conundrum that Ms. Garcia gave us of, you know, if we don't, if it's not fair use, but we're also not granting a, a copyright on this derivative work, even if it's a derivative work that is limited to 70 years from its input materials, how do we, in fact, incentivize those new creations? Yeah, so uh, in my testimony, I have been telling you to grant a copyright on works so long as the author demonstrates minimal uh, creativity in the works. We've uh, been, been doing so. I've also suggested that um, human authors should be compensated and have control of their works when they're ingested into an AI data training set, but that's for another, uh, for another hearing. Um, I, I wanted to be clear, though, I think there may be some uh, misunderstanding in terms of how I view the copyright guidance. Um, I think we're thinking about filling out registration applications like lawyers think about filling out registration applications. And so to us, we look at the application, we say, well, what's easy? Like, let's put a number on it. Let's put a bright line test. How much, right? Quantitatively, how much is too much GAI use? And that's not an artist's process when an artist is creating a work. An artist is not sitting there saying like, okay, I've used like this many prompts, I've, I've like engaged this way, right? An artist is in the flow working and creating the, the uh, image that they're creating and they're not stopping to think that way. So I'm trying to suggest how to make a test that is intuitive to an artist and asking you to think qualitatively about how the artist is using the tool rather than quantitatively. And on that note, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the gentleman from Texas. Chairman, you've been a, a gracious chairman, I understand, and I do know the protocols of. Um, Would the gentlelady like a short time to be waived in at the discretion of the chairman at this time? I, I, I would be overwhelmed if I was given that. And, and I am overwhelmingly supportive of the gentlelady is recognized. Well, I want everyone to know that uh, Chairman Eisen and I thank um, uh, the, the very gracious ranking member, Mr. Johnson, but Chairman Eisen and I have been. Uh, on these matters for a long time. So the only thing that I will uh, pose not to prolong is the question of sourcing. Um, and um, which it looks as, as, as I was listening, sourcing was permeated throughout. The artist is in the flow, and that means that the artist is not necessarily sourcing. They are just in the flow. So did someone just take um, a stab at the random sourcing artists versus the more precise engineer um, when it comes to AI. And I, I have some legislation that I would like this committee to look at. I am not on the committee, but have a deep abiding um, commitment and interest to this area. But the whole idea of um, sourcing uh, in the AI world, would someone uh, care to comment on how meticulous we have to be? Um, what does that do to the college student uh, that is now facing that? or particularly the grad student that's now facing that, without any boundaries, what, what do we have now? What world are we living in now on sourcing? I hope I've tried to be, I have professors here. I'll yield to whoever wants to take a stab at that. So uh, I'll just say I, I feel very strongly that there needs to be liability for the GAI companies who train um, their tools, um, they need to appropriately source materials to train their tools. Um, and that artists uh, whose uh, creative works are used to train GAI tools should have compensation and the control over the use of their works. Uh, so that's my position on training um, GAI tools. 
but this particular hearing, um, we weren't asked to talk about that issue. And so um, my uh, view is that liability for training of GAIs has to be resolved, but that denying IP protection to otherwise protectable works to humans who use GAIs um, is uh, counterproductive uh, because that will relegate the work that they create using GAIs to this category of synthetic data. Um, and um, that will harm the legitimate human creators of works by harming them on the input side, by using their work to train the machine, and then harming them again on the output side by not giving them the ability to get a copyright on their work um, if they have otherwise met the originality requirements in creating that work. So that's, that would be my position. I, I opened up, I don't know if there's one, other, one, one, one of the other that wanted to answer, and I realized what the topic of the um, hearing was. I, I figured I should get in the door before it got closed on me. Anyone else want to just Yeah, comment? I think if I understood your, correct, your question correctly, that you were asking about sourcing on the output side so that you would know what portion of your work comes from the AI versus what portion comes from the person. And I think that that's actually a really important question because I think that at the end of the day, if you can't point to something that was sourced by the AI, then you have surpassed any threshold. It is your work at that point. It's when you can point to something and say, yeah, that part right there, that came from the AI. That's when you should not be receiving copyright over at least that portion of the work. Very important. I, I don't know. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, he's, he's been very kind. I didn't know the professor no. was trying to finish her sentence. Please, can, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. Matt. No, no, sorry. I was, I was going to add that I think um, I agree with Professor Eyestar's assessment that even though it's not the topic of this particular hearing, an answer on, on the training data is important because I, I also empathize with the, the inclination to say, well, if we can't compensate them on the inputs, mm -hmm. I think we probably should, then maybe let's compensate them on the outputs. The challenge statutorily, right, is that our current definition for derivative works doesn't allow those outputs to be copyrightable, right, because they can't point to a particular pre-existing work, it's just billions of works, uh, two, that they are themselves not copyrightable, um, and uh, three, and most importantly, they're not authorized. So all of those things would have to be true to get a proper derivative work copyright. And with that, I'm going to ask all the witnesses to, to give us three, thank the gentlelady, three indulgences. One, answer questions from, that will be submitted from any member that was here or unable to be here, including uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Two, please revise and extend thoughts that you have as a result of today's hearings and uh, Ms. Garcia and the others, including areas that might be tangential to this but clearly cover this subcommittee's jurisdiction and uh, AI. So don't be inhibited by the limitation of this because we can't have you on every panel, we can't have you at every round table, but we want your input. Uh, so if you'll do all of that for us, we would appreciate it. Uh, additionally, the ranking member and myself are always available for uh, ex parte type uh, events if you have additional ideas or requests. This is a challenge for us because as all of you said, you don't want us to do anything except perhaps undo what has already been done. And we see a, a lot of potential wisdom in that, but we also are monitoring this in a way in which we want to make sure that we prevent uh, harm from developing. And with that, not having gone back into my Billy Joel example to any of you, which would have been my next question, we stand adjourned.